If you're like me, you've played shooter after shooter since the time you could first hold a controller in your hands, and over the years, your muscle memory has gotten to a point where the appeal of target acquisition has become muddied by repetition. At least for myself, someone who rarely buys games outside of his comfort zone, as of late, shooters fresh in the market haven't been able to grab my interest. Even as their flaunting unique enemy design, exciting weaponry, rekindling interest in historical eras, and game modes that recontextualize the same fundamentals. Not to paint them all with the same broad stroke, of course not. But outside of Doom Eternal and one or two smaller titles, there wasn't anything that really dazzled my itch for room clearing and headshotting in 2020. The result of which was me replaying the same old Steam games I haven't uninstalled since I built my PC. I've been yearning for my taste to be brought in for a while now, without much of a clue of what to try next. Then came along the fall event of Flight Simulator that prompted me to buy a baseline joystick. It was fun while it lasted, but after I got bored of flying over my house, I decided to liberate the 200 gigabytes that it was holding hostage on my hard drive. And now I was stuck figuring out how I was going to justify buying this damn thing. However, I'd find that by solving this problem, I would wound up solving the former. Cautiously, I tried my hand at a genre that, before my joystick came along, seemed a bit too out of reach for me. Dogfighters. Archaic games on wings that completely recontextualize everything about shooting things to pieces, by locking you in a cockpit behind the stick and trusting you in the boundlessness of open space. I came to realize that if there was any time to rediscover the adrenaline rush of screen centering and trigger pulling, now was certainly it. It's been years, in fact, a little bit more than a decade since dogfighters were still regularly being made before they gradually died out of popularity. Excluding War Thunder, modern examples of dogfighting being put front and center of games with much notoriety have been far and few. I suppose one of the expected reasons behind this is due to how commonly they are misperceived as falling under the same umbrella as flight simulators, those games whose primary demographic are enthusiasts, ex-pilots, people trying to sell their rip-off Tom Clancy novels, and apparently German grandmas. So at face value, it's not hard to see why. Their experiences are generally sold around mastering a piece of complex machinery, whether it's actually the case or not. It could be an F-22 Raptor or a fictional X-Wing on the box, it doesn't really seem to matter. Dogfighters, whether they have a realistic aesthetic or not, are commonly confused as having a sharp learning curve, an unfortunate half-truth. Despite an endless amount of games like Battlefield, Battlefront, Planetside 2, Halo, GTA Online, Just Cause, Far Cry, Saints Row, No Man's Sky, and even Spyro being benefited by the inclusion of an aerial combat component, it seems it would take a lot of convincing to sell an experience solely based around that premise. However, in recent years, that premise has made a comeback. Much in the way certain franchises that have been largely responsible for popularizing genres have rebranded and more or less rebooted themselves, dogfighters, some bearing new titles and some carrying the same, have flown out from under the shadows in a proper return to form, establishing themselves distinctly with what they were originally so renowned for. And although the momentum is comparably speaking slow, it's picking up even as of the making of this video. So to people like myself who never felt compelled to give them a go despite their preferences generally leaning towards the fast adrenaline filled action that they mean to emulate, there's suddenly plenty more reasons to give them a shot. In my instance, it wasn't just out of a desire to try something new. Of course, there was a global pandemic going on, but I wanted to get some mileage out of this new toy on my desk. So around the time I wiped my hands of Flight Simulator, attempted DCS for about 20 minutes, 
and clawing my way through the last few stages of Doom Eternal, weirdly, did the antithesis of all three of these experiences combine in a couple of games that have been on my radar, but that I've never been courageous enough to try out of fear of not enjoying them. What follows is a small list of games that I've tried in that time since, and that have easily become some of the most thrilling I've played in recent years. All of them, in one shape or another, have defiled my expectations and demonstrated how much life this often overlooked genre still has in it. But before I was going to commit to any game beyond the $20 mark, I decided to test the waters. Luckily, I stumbled upon a way with a game that has outlived its contemporaries by decades, all thanks to the efforts of a modding community that is devoted to see it live through another. As we speak, Convoys of transports, freighters, and medical ships are heading for the jump nodes to Vega and Epsilon Pegasi. The evacuation of civilian personnel proceeds on schedule, but the enemy offensive has intensified. Alpha Wing, you have your orders. Prioritize enemy bombers. Released in 2000 for Windows to overwhelmingly positive reviews, Free Space 2 did abysmal in terms of sales. Whether it was due to the time it was released, undistinctive art, or just growing on interest in PC dogfighters around the time, it's hard to say why it failed. I just know that in all the time since, I've yet to meet anyone who's actually heard of it. Which is a damn shame because all the things that I know people love about those early TIE Fighter games is done past the point of perfection in Free Space 2. And judging by Squadron's recent success, it makes this game's obscurity slightly puzzling. It's as underrated as underrated gems come. Built into a sci-fi atmosphere that takes all of its cues from Aliens and Event Horizon, Free Space 2 is a game about space war that has you fight a campaign against these Red Invader dudes hell-bent on human extinction. Playing much more as a shooter than the likes of Elite Dangerous or Star Citizen, this game is an accumulation of their most intense aspects that maintains its focus firmly around space combat rather than the more mundane aspects of simulation. Outside of its price and my retrospective interest, I chose to start this list with Free Space 2 instead of a game more well known because, out of all the games on this list that I've played, this one easily hooked me the quickest and never ceased to engage me in the most upright of ways. In learning its somewhat more advanced control scheme than what I'm used to, I found a game that was consistently physically exhilarating cranking and turning the stick to keep centered on a target in motion while simultaneously tangling around cruisers that dwarf the size of your own, all while piercing away at their shields with punchy sounding energy weapons and missiles that light up the screen, is not only a treat to the eyes and ears, but every other aspect of your input. Being the first dogfighter I had attempted, the result of all the input that was demanded left me surprised that my joystick held together by the time I was done with it. And usually I'm not about that baby shit that involves taking a break every 20 minutes like instruction manuals suggest, but having a paper bag on standby is a pretty good idea, especially if you're going to be top gunning it like me. Even in the earlier missions when I was given simple objectives like clearing an asteroid belt of enemies or taking on a small fleet, I was always compelled to sit up straight and keep discord calls muted, which I found would become a trend as this list went on. It was a genuine thrill ride that surprisingly didn't take much effort to get into. The only effort on my part was a bit of control learning, sorting out my yawn pitch, and before long I was having a blast. With a 12 hour campaign to boot, dogfighting is not the only focus. You'll undergo plenty of diverse roles throughout the story, bombing runs, asset retrieval, covert ops, cruiser defense, and sometimes a combination of multiple, all in a vast array of distinct spacecraft with customizable loadouts. But regardless of what you're doing, the most notable aspect of Free Space 2 will be apparent to anyone familiar with Halo's combat design, where target acquisition isn't the be-all and end-all of every player enemy encounter, but rather it necessitates a more thoughtful approach to deal with enemies who aren't easily dissuaded by absorbing damage. All enemy ships have shields that need to be penetrated before any real damage can be done to them. Cutting through this is the only way to expose them to actual damage, and even then, different ship classes can possess distinct traits like additional hull armor and mobility. What this does is get you to switch up your game, as well as the weapons you use on a moment to moment basis, as each has their own pros and cons. For instance, some projectiles are better off suited against hull damage, and others better off against shields. Additionally, you can choose to combine two different kinds of projectiles, but usually at the cost of them rapidly draining your energy supply. 
This becomes a huge trade-off, especially if you plan on taking a more nimble ship with a smaller power supply. Missiles do not use energy, but obviously have a limit to how much you can carry. Larger payloads aren't as great as making turns than their smaller and more numerous counterparts, so they're better off suited against fighters from a distance or subsystems of a slow-moving capital ship. My most preferable loadout was to use weaker rockets that could be point-fired rapidly in conjunction with my cannons. This gave a huge advantage to chipping away at an enemy's health or dealing with finishing off a smaller subsystem of the cruiser if I was close enough. And the bombs, although they are very mission-dependent, are satisfying as hell. Seriously, don't even get me started. Well, individual fighters aren't anything to be fretful of, levels go from a couple of squadrons to companies, with multiple capital ships getting involved within moments. When they teleport into the battle, it only further ups the ante, as the Sheevans have a knack for demonstrating their technological superiority, often decimating entire friendly ships. Not only does this make things just feel a lot more intense, it surprisingly makes things feel more grounded, as you're not always winning and you get a proper sense of helplessness when these big guys show up, as you can often be ordered to retreat, prompting an intentional mission failure screen. We've lost the Trinity. All wings return to base. We're avoiding this mission. You confronted an overwhelming Shivan force in a hostile environment. Under these circumstances, there was nothing you or anyone else could have done to save the Trinity and our boarding party. Caught in the openness of space, FS2 comes to expect sharp reflexes and wits over distance and accuracy. Since there is no way of covering yourself from enemy fire, space superiority and maneuvering become huge factors in what determines your success in a mission. In a similar sense to how there is a way to play Doom Eternal, and that is certainly not by standing at the end of an arena headshotting goons, FS2 thrives off of its intensity, always requiring you to make sharp adjustments in the midst of chaos and it does this splendidly by thrusting you into tangles of enemies complemented by huge vessels that take coordination to take down. I suppose this is why I associate Free Space 2 with Doom Eternal so much. Despite obvious differences, it still is a thinking man shooter at heart. Not in that it requires tactical patience, but rather constant innovation of tactics. From your use of weapons to movement, and even how you use your squadron, you need to be on top of everything or you're dead. If it weren't intense enough for a shooter like this on a horizontal plane, you can be provoked from 360 degrees in rotation. Luckily, the learning curve is much more approachable than what you might think going off of just watching gameplay. Throughout the campaign, you undergo bite-sized training segments that teach you more advanced inputs, like the aforementioned energy diversion, as well as squadron commands and cruiser subsystem locking. These missions get to the point and can be skipped once you had your fill, or skipped in their entirety. This gives even a casual player the ability to enjoy the agency possible within all the mechanics without bordering into DCS territory. And once you get the fundamentals down, rarely will you be bumbling around the keyboard trying to find the right key mid-combat. There is a notable reason that I attribute to all of the elements of Free Space's gameplay working as well as they do, something that would be of the utmost importance in a genre built around speed and maneuvering. And that is how it provides you with a combined sense of feedback and physicality in just about everything that you do. From torpedoes to plasma, to even just down to what can be collided with or destroyed, there are no invisible walls, and outside of some very convincing skyboxes, or space boxes rather, everything you see is a real physical object that can possess some kind of threat. Going right up to the engine of a ginormous cruiser will blow you back, and colliding with another fighter will knock your ship out of alignment, or with enough velocity and damage taken, it can crash right through you. Most notably, being caught in the shockwave of a capital ship exploding is enough to make you poo a little, as you can either be destroyed or sent flying like a spitball out of a fourth grader straw. Here we go. Why I draw attention to it is that I find it winds up adding a lot to the battlefield frenzy of space combat. Not only are some of these occurrences quite riveting to experience, they give everything a sense of presence, especially the scale of the larger ships, making you feel like you're a fly buzzing around a huge crustacean that has the ability to crush you into dust at a moment's notice. It goes a long way in aiding to the somber, ominous atmosphere that crosses the border into the best kind of science fiction horror by making you feel incredibly small in a universe full of things of unconceptional scale. Some of the most memorable levels in the game have you flying in these uncharted nebulas where your vision is completely obscured. 
These segments are drenched in suspense, as you can hardly see in the fog, all while anticipating something of potentially any size to come through and totally overwhelm you and your friendly forces. All well faded and haunted choirs play in the background. Although Free Space 2, being as old as it is, may not encompass what you initially would have thought I'd be talking about in a video titled The Renaissance of the Dogfighter, it was still the best way I could have gotten introduced to the genre in the current year. It has aged without flaw, and its gameplay is strung together a lot better than some of the more notable dogfighters of the last 10 years even. But the underlying reason has to be how it's been supported by an incredible modding community. In the form of a couple of launchers, most notably the Kenosis launcher, your 12 hours of playing the vanilla campaign potentially could become endless, thanks to the sheer amount of free content that they offer up. To me, it easily justifies keeping it installed and keeping my joystick well within reach. While Free Space 2 is still very obscure by modern standards, these platforms have continued to give it life over the last 20 years, way more than anything that the original developers could have possibly hoped for. For example, you might be wondering how a game from the year 2000 looks this great, and the answer is that it doesn't. The original game actually looks like this. Through the Kenosis launcher, within seconds you can install an updated Free Space 2 campaign that retains everything about the original's feel, while completely overhauling every aspect of the visuals, making this game look like it came out in the last 7 years, as opposed to 21. It's only when you're in the sub-HD menus and listening to voiceovers of sometimes inconsistent quality that the cracks can start to show, but when you're in-game, you don't need rose-tinted glasses. The quality of these graphical improvements is arguably on par with other fan projects akin to Black Mesa. And that's only the beginning of it. There is a whole library of custom campaigns that I haven't even begun to touch, and that's not even taking into account the mods on the internet that you can import into these libraries. After about 30 or so hours with Free Space 2, I get a feeling that I'm just getting started. If you're craving something new and aren't sure if you'd enjoy some of the more pricey games I'm about to get to, for only 11 USD on Steam, Free Space 2 would be an excellent place to start. The Kingdom of Erugia has declared war on the Ocean Federation. The International Space Elevator has been seized by the Erugian Army. Reports say former President Harling was touring the site at the time, but his current whereabouts are unknown. Hearing about the upcoming release of Ace Combat 7 a couple years ago, I gave serious consideration into whether I'd actually enjoy it or not. I tend to have a knack for sleek, authentic military prowess, especially when it's bundled into a light science fiction setting in order to give it some creative liberty. But it made an intimidating impression. These airplanes, they look tricky, and I felt the premise would be lost on me. As someone who's never touched an Ace Combat game outside of a mixed experience with the free-to-play PS3 version, I was conflicted. The trailers were impressive, impressive enough for me to toy with the idea of giving it another shot. Because what they showed seemed nothing short of spectacular. Something of a love child between Top Gun and the crazier parts of Metal Gear Solid 4's cutscenes packaged into what very convincingly seemed like actual gameplay. Still, I'm a cheap ass, and $60 is a lot to ask of me. As stated, I rarely do buy games at full price, especially in the surrounding AAA space. And rightfully so, I've been and seen so many people get burnt by them. So only unless I'm positively certain that I'll enjoy past the 60 hour mark, thank you for your teachings, will I go running for my flimsy wallet. But goddamn, I should have listened to my buyer's instinct, because after free space, I finally loaded up this bad boy, and within minutes, I couldn't remember if I had taken pre-workout that day. Swerving and circling and twisting my arms and hands as if it would have an effect on how tightly my plane turned, it was pretty engrossing, just not for anyone who had to watch. As much as I likened Free Space to a thrill ride, Ace Combat had an entirely different vibe that I can only really compare to when my dad first let me drive on the freeway, expecting the cars to be going the same direction as me. Speed was the new name of the game, while Free Space retained its attention firmly around the different ways you can take down targets with different weapon types, AC7 is all about considering what angle and velocity you use to take on objectives providing a much higher ceiling for growing your skills behind the stick as opposed to Free Space 2. I felt this immediately by the reversed importance of weapon rolls. Your primary weapons are mainly homing missiles that have a limited turning radius, 
so eyeing the trajectory of your targets, as well as the angle you'll be at them from when you fire, is what determines a hit or otherwise. With the high speeds you'll usually be in, it's almost needless to say that the emphasis on using your gun is far less than that of a game that takes place in zero-g gravity with laser cannons instead of bullets. Not to say that there aren't lasers. So since enemies can evade your screen so easily, and due to the great distinction of how your aircraft turns quickest when its nose is being pulled up in any said direction, that is, if you play this game the way it was intended to be, not this baby shit, point accuracy was far more difficult on a moving target, albeit not impossible. This makes combat a frantic loop that pins on you timing your pulls, adjusting your speed, and timing when you fire. This might sound frustrating, but it's the momentary tension that builds between when you acquire a target, working your way into a position, to lining up a shot and finally sending a missile their way that makes the gameplay as satisfying as it is. And when you get a handle on it, specifically the flying part, it's enthralling to line your way through takedown after takedown. With the distances and speeds you're able to conquer in sheer seconds, on top of the wider angles that are required to make a proper pass on enemies, ground or air, Ace Combat 7 comes to be a refreshing test of your spatial ability, as understanding where you are relative to the world and other units, as well as a comprehension of your aircraft's maneuverability, determines how much you can destroy. Luckily for anyone starting out, the sky is literally the limit in every level giving you plenty of room for you to jet around in and to get comfortable, making the very fragile damage model not so much of a hurdle for novice players. And by fragile, I mean one clip of the wings and you're a fireball. Obviously, I found wrapping my head around this took a little bit more time than Free Space's more direct approach to combat did. But what did not was the actual controls. Let me start this part of the video off by giving a disclaimer to anyone unfamiliar with Ace Combat from someone mostly unfamiliar with Ace Combat. This game, or I suppose series rather, cannot in any sense be compared to a flying simulator. Don't be misled by the numbers on the HUD or the instruments in the cockpit. All but one are textures. This game is solely high octane flying at speeds of up to 2000 km an hour between buildings with enough ordnance on your wings to destroy both Death Stars two times over. Watching the opinions of gaming journalists who had given their takes on both early and final versions of Ace Combat 7, was I surprised to see how they described the entry barrier into a game like this. Yes, it's a flying game, so by nature it's going to be something that takes some getting adjusted to if you're used to nothing but corridor shooting. But the actual flight controls don't far exceed anything outside of GTA 5's Harrier Jets, which I'm sure a hardcore fan of this series might even take offense to. So even though this says expert, turn it the fuck on if it's your first time playing. That needed to be said. And now is where the fun really begins. Gradually things like lining up gun runs and pulling out in just the nick of time, or flying through a string of bogeys you've just exploded, will become things of second nature. Building up your skills beyond the fundamentals reaps reward, not only in how you progress through the unlock tree, but how you can manage to chop down the time it takes for you to clear through stages. It can be blood pumping when you get to the point where scores on levels that originally were too difficult for you to even get close to can be exceeded by nearly double their requirement. And it only gets better the more you play. As a game that I misperceived years ago as something that would get stale quickly, I became astonished at the depth behind it. I suppose I find it impressive how a relatively simple premise on paper can be enjoyable as it is to master, especially as the game expands and introduces more variation to the formula. With huge levels packed with enemies, numerous aircraft, special weaponry, and distinctive boss fights, 60 hours between two versions of this game, and it's yet to become dull. Is everyone here? Settle down. Settle down. The focal point of the game is undoubtedly the single player, in which you'll undergo an outlandish 20 stage campaign. Each stage has its own shtick that invites replaying it. You'll be dogfighting in canyons, bombing the hell out of enemy bases, comically dodging searchlights in a stealth mission, to all out aerial battles with these titanous aircraft and their own hive of onboard UAVs. Well, not every level is a standout, the majority have their own highlights, and as the game goes on, the bar of intensity just gets set higher as your destructive capabilities and skill behind the stick are routinely put to the test. And did I say stick? That reminds me. As we've already mentioned, this is easily the purchase I was the most regretful of not making sooner. I enjoyed it so much that, even though I had it on Xbox Game Pass for only like a dollar, I was compelled to make a full purchase on Steam. And I did that in order to accomplish two things. First, play it at a resolution greater than 144p. Second, tinker with my joystick to see if it was viable for a game like this. 
Well, as expected, the game ended up looking excellent on my PC, but I was let down that AC7 didn't come built in with any joystick functionality, so I had to scour web forms and mess around in some of the game's files to get it to work, only with mixed results. As I restarted from the beginning, I have to admit, the joystick did feel great. I had a lot more precision with the gun than I had with the controller, and I was able to breeze through the opening levels without much difficulties as I relearned all the controls. However, around the third mission, I came to realize that I was far less efficient, both air to ground and air to air, due to one thing the joystick can't do as well as the controller, braking, something that you come to find is essential in AC7. I'm not a master at this game, but if I understand it correctly, pulling down on the left trigger and right trigger simultaneously puts you in a state where your plane can briefly turn sharply, kind of like a drift, even to the point where insanely skilled players can do flips that break the laws of physics. You can't really do this on a joystick that only has one lever for a throttle, so Ace Combat 7 didn't really land too much to getting used out of the joystick, and I reluctantly played it with an Xbox One controller. Not really a knack on the game overall, as I don't really know whether it was intended to be supported or not, although it seems kind of strange considering the subject matter. The only real disappointment with the package is the multiplayer, as the variety and the care that went into the single player is noticeably absent in the online component. An online component that's lined up with generic PvP game modes, most of which boil down to meat grinders for novice and intermediate players going up against the most devoted of pilots. Zulu 1, down! You shouldn't let that discourage you though, Ace Combat 7 impressed the heck out of me nonetheless, and has gracefully made me a fan. For a little less than a full price game at the time of making this, you get a masterful single player that is easily worth the price of admission on its own, and if you're like me, hopefully it can liven up your leisure time if you're looking for a refreshing take on blowing shit up. Sicario, you, alongside other Allied forces, will cover an immediate evacuation of our troops still holding out on the ground. Any more men, we might not be able to continue fighting against the Federation. Missile is tracking. What I've come to find interesting about Ace Combat 7, or rather, the legacy of Ace Combat as a series, would have to be its devoted fanbase. If only a slight peek down the rabbit hole of retrospectives, examinations of lore, and individuals hell-bent on breaking a 15-year-old game's physics wasn't enough to prove how much of an impression this lineage of games has left on people, the existence of Project Wingman should be sufficient proof enough. Enough at least to show how love and passion can give properties, and by extension, genres, a whole new life. Even to the point where it results in the birth of games that can stand shoulder to shoulder with their inspirations. By far one of the most impressive indie games that I've played in the last 12 months, Project Wingman takes a stab precisely at the arcadey dogfighting that Skies Unknown reintroduced. Hosting a much more amber color palette than the latter's pretty blue skies, any other differences between the two are much more minimal. And that's not to be discrediting. In fact, it's in how it slightly deviates from that formula in what it intentfully emulates that winds up going a long way in complementing its own distinctive gameplay. For instance, the way that loadouts and the overall scale of firepower is handled, but the core of dogfighting and ground support are in essence molded right from Ace Combat's frame. Levels are wide open sandboxes packed with various types of enemies that are just begging to be destroyed, in which the emphasis still remains on sharp angle adjustment and timing your volleys. Although it's certainly more repetitive than its role models, its core gameplay strengths are up to match with them. For these reasons, I don't believe there's much point in talking about Wingman as an experience, but more so about the fact of its existence. An existence that makes it a notable outcrier of the potential and demand that dogfighters still possess. Although it took years on the part of only three people, its consumer reception and sales have spoken for themselves, and it serves as the most recent piece of evidence that there still is a market for these kinds of games. A market that success can be found in without needing a multi-million dollar creative license to get people interested. Although that certainly helps. As I speak, Imperial forces are edging toward the Bormia sector, hoping to end our new Republic before we find our footing. As their empire collapses, they try to tighten their grip. But the galaxy is changing, and you can be a part of it. With the help of brave and daring pilots, this war can end. Make a choice. Fly with the new Republic. Change our galaxy for the better.
by far the most commercial game on this list, EA Squadrons was by far the one I was the most skeptical of. If the glaring E and A in the header wasn't enough of warning for catastrophe, the star and wars that followed it surely was. Being well versed with 2017's Battlefront 2, I was certain that Squadrons at the bare minimum was going to be able to dazzle me with its immaculate detailing of starfighters and effects pulled right from the movies. However, this is Electronic Arts, and where some are lured by an exciting premise, most sensible people are skeptical of the potential for things to go wrong. I felt there was no way in hell they were going to be able to pull it off in a manner that could rival those larger profile Star Wars games that they had to spend years pulling out of a fire, and judging by its asking price, it seemed that they knew it wasn't the same deal that their previous games were meant to be. Although, gradually, it began to sound like, to the right person, there was a lot to be found amusing about Squadrons, especially if you had $800 sitting around. Well, I certainly did not, but I had a secondary objective of getting use out of this joystick. Besides, at this point, I had found that dogfighters could very well be what they were cranked up to be, so I decided to give it a go. Excellent work. A couple of goes, actually. I was hoping to fulfill my quota with the 9 hour EA play trial, but somehow I passed out with the game open. So I had to give in and make the full purchase, but afterwards I can safely say that Squadrons ain't half bad. Despite all the relearning it required to get to that conclusion, the and the ain't all those puppies got in store. For starters, the Squadrons flight model is pretty competent, a bit more weightier than I had come to expect. Ships don't exactly handle like a 747 filled to the cockpit with dumbbells, nor do they like a CGI British kid on a magic broom. Instead, it sits somewhere in the middle of Free Space's almost first-person shooter-style handling and the weightier design of AC-7 that requires a lot more pulling. It feels quite responsive, while providing a real sense of inertia at the same time. In Squadrons, you go in the direction that you pull the stick in with moderate ease. Aerial, or rather space combat, is less about controlling speed for sharper turns as it is about other functions of your ship, evident by the versatile setting that puts your starfighter in a state where you can roll or turn the easiest. This seems to exist in order to disconcern you with constantly adjusting your throttle, unless you're attempting to flee or stop completely. This winds up giving a stage for a unique combination of mechanics to play more of a role instead, mechanics that prioritize the distribution of your power supply as well as satisfying your trigger-happy impulses. It's an interesting departure of where the challenge usually lies in these kinds of games. Point-fire projectiles play a predominant role in squadrons, much like they do in Free Space 2. The major difference lies within how where you hit a ship doesn't seem to be of much importance, as the distance and speed you'll typically engage enemies at don't lend enough opportunity for that kind of accuracy to play a role. I make mention of it because of the way dogfights generally play out, as they put an emphasis on closing within firing distance and best utilizing your limited energy supply for weapons. It's unique in the sense that it makes you fly a bit more cautiously in dogfights in order to find a window to rapidly chip away at a target's health. My only complaint with this dynamic is on fault with how enemies don't tend to react to the damage they receive, even when they're on their last leg. As well, they tend to default between two modes, attack and flee, but never in a manner that's reactive. Either way, Squadron still makes the most out of this newfound focus on timing energy usage by how it influences more than just how you attack enemy pilots. There exists some variation, especially between different starfighters, but what things primarily come down to is how you use your juice. You like the juice, eh? <laughs> Which leads us to the second part of Squadron's gameplay loop, switch flipping. The TIE Fighter influence of managing a shared power supply that affects weapons, engines, and shields felt a bit strange to begin with, especially coming off of Free Space 2, which uses the exact same system, but in a less constraining way. Constraining is actually not a bad attribute in this sense, as Squadrons takes what was kind of a background utility in that game and thrust it into the center of everything you do in moment-to-moment -moment combat. From a gameplay perspective, it actually makes a lot of sense that most X-Wings and TIE Fighters run on batteries scavenged from the TV remote between the cushions of your couch, because it provides an additional level of strategy on top of all the shooting that you do. Squadron keeps things simple by just allowing you to maximize one thing at a time, or keeping your power in a balanced mode. The result of this makes the hectic nature of space combat adopt a rock-paper-scissors sort of approach especially on higher difficulties where your shortcomings thanks to this power system are felt with abundant clarity. Keeping an eye on this part of the screen tends to be very important regardless of what you're doing, 
because of how susceptible your inputs can be to failing if you don't get enough juice pumped into what you need. We are not losing anyone else. For instance, like working your way into an angle on a target, only for your cannons to flatten it out like you trying to start an old lawnmower that hasn't been primed. Which can happen a lot if you've taken a break from this game for a while and come back to it. Interestingly, this power supply gives the greatest variation between the two factions you switch between over the course of the single player. Certain ships feel completely different in how they use this mechanic, as not only do they have distinct flight traits as well as weapons, but Imperial ships are completely absent of any kind of shielding for the most part, unlike their Rebellion counterparts. The trade-off comes in the form of the ability to recharge one of your two power meters at a second's notice with this handy dandy recharge switch, which allows you to be a lot more dangerous if you can master when and what to put power into. This makes the factions feel very distinctive, ironically making rebel ships feel more well-rounded, but imperial ships leaning much more towards guerrilla-style tactics, as this feature makes getting out of a bad situation a hell of a lot easier. I understand pitching a power supply mechanic like this to a new player might not sell squadrons very well. However, the control scheme plays an important role in wrapping your head around it, especially if you're playing this game with a joystick, which I believe is a bare minimum. Thankfully, the one I own, by far the most common and budget-friendly option out there, works out of the box with squadrons, with zero need to screw around in the options menu. With all the gizmos reasonably binded in a way that makes sense, there is no need to bind additional actions to your keyboard with everything else moved out of the way. If it weren't for two issues, I'd say this game is as deserving of your time as Ace Combat or Free Space but to me they are quite significant problems. Number uno comes as a result of the restrictive nature of some arenas. Although levels are relatively open for the most part and allow you to fight with some degree of cover, there doesn't seem to be enough of it. This isn't such a blatant sin on its own, but when combat heats up, bottleneck situations can easily arise. In a few situations, you have no choice but to go up against swarms of enemies head on without the ability to make a more advantageous approach. Understandably somewhat, this is done for the sake of scripted set pieces, but coupled with the fact that most ships are pretty piss poor at absorbing damage, they result in a lot of trial and error. Playing on a more intermediate difficulty, the frustration I encountered in some of these set pieces may not have been anybody's fault but my own. However, it did give me some Call of Duty 2 on veteran flashbacks, where the intensity of the enemy volume never seemed to waver. Being in the void of open space in some of these situations made them feel kind of unfair. In one instance, I had to turn the game off for the night. This wasn't necessarily a consistent issue throughout, but it did linger somewhat, and it made the objective variety over the course of the campaign a bit harder to appreciate. Although, the more I learned from playing, the more aggressively, and I mean aggressively, I was able to take on encounters with less and less setbacks. The second thing has nothing to do with the gameplay. Now, I'm not here to sell you on the masterful narratives that dogfighting games are renowned for, but some due diligence falls on my part for discussing squadrons due to the nature of how its narrative is incorporated to the structure of the single player. If anybody was wondering how I felt about it, well, it's dull and it reeks of too many uninspired character archetypes, but that's not my problem with it. It's in how the game forcibly puts them upon you. Out of all the games I've spoken of this far, the intermission sequences in squadrons became the most annoying so annoying that I began to dread them. At least in AC7, Wingman, and Free Space, you could skip scenes once you had your fill of what needed to be done for the next mission. Squadrons would rather give you your objectives in between trademark EA melodrama that's chocked full of quippy characters that don't merit a reaction. The hangar sequences are by far the worst offender of this problem, as they force you to listen to your obnoxious crewmates give monologues about their life stories that will have you fantasizing about them getting killed off within moments. No! I went from semi-pro racing to fighting the Empire. No! God, please, no! Everyone no! Through the rise and fall of trends, displacement of publishers and properties, as well as independent developers bringing about new flair with passion projects of their own, dogfighters have surfed a varying wave over the last two generations, going through a tumultuous and bygone era of throwaway bargain bin dogfighters to even credited names behind acclaim licenses fumbling under the weight of their past achievements or for completely other reasons. As a result, interest in this genre sharply declined halfway through the seventh generation, to the point where they were largely absent through the entirety of the eighth. 
Piloting a game through distinctive aerial combat and continuous momentum in the expanse of open space seems to be a difficult thing to land, or even pitch for that matter. But in a similar fashion to survival horror, it's taken some strong wills to reintroduce it. Only in this instance, the driving force has come from all tiers of the industry, from a small three-man team, to a vetted mid-tier developer, to the most corporate and villainous of publishers. Dogfighters have re-emerged in three titles that have set insanely high bars while staying true to their lineage, and as evident by the earliest game on this list, some have maintained that level of quality and have only gotten better with time. Some just haven't had their moment in the spotlight. As someone who only wanted to justify a purchase of a joystick and ended up stumbling upon these gems, did I find my biggest takeaway from the anarchy of 2020. Every single title on this list was an absolute blast that left me coming back for more. And although I'm a bit regretful that it's taken me this long for me to give them a shot, I'm glad that I discovered them when I did. Games like these don't come out every year, nor do they every generation. And even with a moderately powered PC like my own, Having access to all of them, especially the latter three which all released in the time span of under two years, has left me with a feeling that I can only really describe as blessed. Whether it was amongst the debris of a huge space cruiser, scanning through the fog of a nebula, or flying into a darkening blue sky, dogfighters in 2019, 2020, and subsequently 2021 have rekindled flare popping and missile walking, and all for the better.